Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. And today, we're going to talk about barbecue. Woo! We're going to talk about cremation. Cremation, not barbecue. If you wish to study barbecue, you should probably take some culinary courses. Cremation has been gaining popularity in the U.S. for years now. Isn't that an understatement? Factors of increase in popularity. Growing acceptance of cremation as a dignified means of disposition. Relocation of elderly to sunbelt areas. Influx of immigrants from cremation-friendly countries. And higher level of education. Now, there are lots of reasons you will study in other classes in regards to the people who choose cremation. A lot of that's mentioned here. Higher level of education, um, lack of, um, not respect, but lack of value in traditional means of doing things. Just do it that way, that sort of stuff. And you'll see those in other classes. Nice thing about cremation is it increases a family option, increases your revenues, but it also increases liability and responsibility. Cremation is irreversible. That's the problem. Once it's done, it's done. Which means if you decided to earn your merit badge and gold star all in one by doing something epically dumb, the court is pretty much going to let you have it. Tri-state crematory should be a good reminder as to why we need to be responsible and diligent in our cremation practices. If you remember Tri-state, we discussed that in one of the previous sections. That was the crematory in Georgia that was taking bodies, just chucking them out back, putting them in a pit, not cream cremation unit. It hadn't worked for years. And a lot of funeral directors got burned on that. And if you ever want to know how and why that could have been fixed, by all means, hit me up. We'll schedule a night maybe, and we can discuss it. The authorization to cremate. This tool in your arsenal to prevent you from getting sued. This authorization is this is to give consent to the cremation from the legally authorized person, which is or who is identified on the form, in regards to the deceased who is identified on the form, as well as information on medical devices, personal effects, ultimate disposition of cremated remains. This is the number one way to keep your bacon out of court. Use a detailed form, fill it out completely every single time. Explain it to the clients every single time. That is not an exaggeration. Fax authorization is permissible, but you really do want to get the originals mailed to you for retention. Remember, if you get dragged in on a negligence hit, what would a reasonable funeral director do in seeing the actual notary, seeing the actual confirmation of ID, seeing the seal might be something important in regards to that reasonable standard. The Cremation Association of North America, cana.org, I believe is their website, created a model cremation law which requires funeral homes and crematories to obtain detailed information from the authorizing agent in the consent form. And there are nine areas of concern, and we will discuss them. Identification of the seed. This one is, by God, a no-brainer. You want to know who it is you are supposed to cremate. You list the basic information regarding the decedent. Ideally, their name, last physical or known address, residence or domicile, preferably residence if they are seasonal, place of death, time of death, and it says social security number. That is a hotly debated one. For purpose of the exams, you should have a social security number. In professional practice, realistically, that will be between you and your state laws. There should be confirmation. The legally authorized person has personally identified the deceased or given authorization for someone else to do so. This is very, very important in confirming identity. One of the biggest hot spots is that do I charge or not charge for the ID? See people come in and identify the body. Now, we're not going to address that in very great depth in this class. All I'm simply going to leave you with as a thought is, is it worth the cost of two eye caps, mouth former, maybe some needle and thread or barb injectors, and a wet sponge to pretty things up or go to court because they don't know? You decide. Identification 
of the authorizing agent. This is where the person signing the form identifies themselves for themselves. Remember the statute. If you need five signatures, you need to get five signatures. If you have five children and the statute says you just need one of them, get all five anyways. Okay? Name, address, and relationship. So you can see where in the hierarchy in your statute under common law they fall. So you have the right person. The authorizing agent represents that they have the right of disposition. They are the legally authorized person. Or if another holds that right, the person signing lists the person by name and that they've given authority for them to do so or that they cannot for whatever stated reason, and those of no reason that they would object to the cremation in general. Now, I am telling you, as a matter of professional practice, that I know what this is saying. As long as that person states that whoever has the power of disposition is okay with them doing this, if you don't already think that that's sketchy, that's a problem, okay, but this is a minimum, you should be willing to go to whoever you need to to get the proper signature. If they don't want mom... To come to the funeral home, that's fine. Sign the form in front of the children. Have them fill it out and say to make this legal, under, you know, explain the statute that the mom has to give authorization unless one of them is a durable power of attorney or a power of attorney over mom capable of engaging in contracts on her behalf. Now, she can get a power of attorney notarized or whatever so someone can act as her for this purpose. Go get the signature. You say, ma'am, sign here, 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 and here. I've explained this to your children. They're all in agreement. Do you wish me to explain it? Are you comfortable with the explanation I gave to them? That's important. Patient right to know. She has a right to have the form explained to her, and if she wants to waive that and says you did explain it to someone and I trust their judgment, that's on. Okay? There are plenty of ways to do the right thing for you in the business as well as keeping everything the way the family wants it. And sometimes you make these type of accommodations. The authorizing agent should disclose any medical devices implanted in the body and authorize removal if needed. Basically, if it is a battery, it should come out. Okay? Pacemakers is the big thing here. You need permission for the pacemakers because you will mutilate the body. Remember that tort? You are making an incision. You're changing the condition of the body. And even though you need to remove it, you need permission to do it. That is not granted by statute. So get the permission to do it. It's usually built into every one of these. Um, and batteries do explode with significant force. People have died because of a pacemaker blowing up in their face. And I, have t I am telling you, having cremated bodies, that when you see a pacemaker coming out of that oven, it is glowing orange. And if you've seen a pacemaker nice and flat, and it is now the shape of an orange, completely spherical, you kind of back away and get the hell out of Dodge quick. Provide a detailed description of the process and all the steps within it. This is necessary for informed consent. This is where things like patient right to know has influenced mortuary law. The best practice that I can tell you is if there is a statute description of cremation that your jurisdiction uses, you should probably take that and put it word for word in your cremation authorization. And you should explain it to your families. You might want to paraphrase. You know, I just this one when you have to give the gory details. But from a liability standpoint, you have to do something here. And I did something. Disposition of personal property. Receive information of what to do with personal effects and then follow through with those instructions. Clothes, jewelry, hair pieces, whatever. Log it in. Have a property sheet. Best practice, I think, is to have it initialed by two people. Have two people going through the inventory and double-checking everything so that nothing walks away. And definitely advise people that jewelry, if it goes through flame-based cremation, may be recognizable after the process. Always, I think, as a professional standard, um, indicate that after you've told them that, yep, you know, cremation is not hot enough to melt precious metals, but it does render them pliable, and it scorches them, so we may not recognize what they are, and when we are sorting out metallic objects, we may think it is something other than what it was, a ring or whatever. Highly recommend that you take these items off and that you put them in the urn after you have filled it with the cremated remains. Seal the bag, put the jewelry and stuff right on top, and then close the urn. If they want to see the urn sealed, or if, I'm sorry, if they want the urn sealed, 
Ask them if they wish to witness you placing the items inside before you seal it. Because if they say, how do we know you did that? And you put that liquid nails on the threads and screwed it shut, you will be cutting that open and buying a new urn. So be aware. Ask lots of questions. Give family 100% information. Receive definitive instructions of what you're going to do with the cremated remains. Obtain permission to ship. Have them give you the address. Um, it says, by a service with tracking requires written receipt from the recipient. Realistically, in the United States, you don't have an option about that. You have to ship them. United States Postal Service, registered or express mail. The cost for express is not that much more than registered, and it is fully trackable. And usually delivery 24 hours anywhere in the United States, 48 hours guaranteed. Highly, highly recommend that you all use um, express mail rather than registered. I have had delays with registered mail where urns did not get what they're supposed to go in time for a funeral. And there's nothing you can do about that. What happens if you decide to leave grandpa with you forever? Get permission. Get permission to dispose in case someone forgets. State laws usually give you a minimum time limit. Here in Florida, for instance, they have 180 days from the point of cremation to come pick them up. And if they are then abandoned, we are able to scatter them in the Gulf of Mexico or provide for some other honorable and customary disposal. Let the family know what the law is. You need to let them know that you can chuck grandpa if they don't come get him. Now, I know that's a little hard. But they need to be impressed that you are not to be a longtime caregiver for this type of product. If you are going to hold this for a long time, you become liable for anything that happens. Someone breaks in and spills the urn, you're going to be sued even though they abandoned it there for two and a half years. So you need to make sure you're on your A-game with this sort of stuff. Why you should usually have two people, one pickup and one backup, so that you can always give it to a family member so that you remove your liability. Recycling metal. Many Americans will have various implants installed for their health. It's common practice to remove these and other metallic objects prior to final processing. If you're not familiar with the cremation process, in a nutshell, I know we've you know, kind of seen that in a previous chapter where it's about the disposition of the processes in cremation. Following the time in the cremation chamber, the human remains are reduced to ash, cremated remains, and bones and bone fragments. Everything out, the non-combustible materials, implants, nails, staples, zippers, buttons, whatever, and then we sort out the metallic items. We use magnets. We sort by hand. You get quite proficient when you've done, you know, a lot of these. And then you pulverize the remaining fragments, bones, and whatever to produce cremated remains. Well, if you intend to recycle the metals, you have to re receive written consent. You can't just take it and chuck it. It's not your property. Okay? Think about what happens here. You have reduced the human body. Quasi-property is gone, right? You now have something different. Cremated remains. Haven't quite gotten a, um, a definitive answer from any of the textbooks. No one's really kind of explored it as to what type of property value is attached to cremated remains. And I would probably say eventually they will adjust quasi-property to it, but realistically it's probably going to be more of property. You can do what you want with it. You have a right to have it, that sort of good stuff, like anything else. But we'll wait to the courts iron that out. But what about the implants? Okay? We don't really have a part of a body. We have an implant, which probably falls into a property theory, does it not? So that is theirs. And if you are just chucking this or recycling it and then donating the money to charity or worse off, collecting the refund, from the recycling agent, you might be found guilty of something like a criminal charge of theft, a tort like conversion. So you want permission to do exactly what's going on here. Also make sure that recycling is permitted by your state. If not, you have to dispose of it, probably as biomedical waste. And if you are disposing for biomedical waste, 
indicate indicate that and keep accurate records, which many of virtually anyone who um, has a biomedical waste transporter, you keep very, very good records of when the stuff went. And I'd probably suggest that if you're going to do something like that, that you um, separate one box probably just for your non-combustible cremation materials so that you can easily track this is the box, this is the label number, this contained whatever. And you can have a log specific for that. So you can let it kind of pile up because it really isn't biomedical. There's nothing on it that's going to hurt anyone like we would. Um, we look at, you know, bloodborne pathogens and whatnot for stuff in the embalming room. So find out what your laws are and obey them. But for ease of tracking, I'd say put all of it in one container and just don't randomly chuck it into other containers because there are rules regarding biomedical waste. Certification and indemnification. The authorizing agent should certify all the information provided is correct and accurate to the best of their knowledge. You couple that with an immunity clause in the statute and you've done your job, right? There should be an indemnification that the funeral home will not be liable for misleading or incorrect information. Because, remember, we have the right to rely. A good statute for disposition for funeral homes, funeral uh, directors, licensed funeral professionals, is that we have a right to rely on what people tell us without having to research it. We've talked about the immunity laws already, okay? As long as you act in good conscience, you've been diligent, done your due diligence, you really can't be liable for an intentional misrepresentation. If they lie to you and you've done your job, to, you know, not that you're paying for a private investigator to look things up, you pretty much are going to be on the straight and narrow. Other cremation forms, well, think about it. When someone comes in to pick it up, you're going to want a receipt, a check-in sheet, some people call it, but receipt of remains from a funeral home. So if you have a uh, cremation service, you're going to want to track stuff that you give back to professionals where they go back to, or they bring something to you. I'm sorry, receipt of remains from a funeral They bring it to you, you check it in. This is specific just for um, the urns. This will be specific for bodies. Your individual states will have regulations as to who must um, do it, when you have to do it, are you authorized to open the containers and look, any of that sort of that good stuff. You're definitely going to want a delivery receipt. So if you are delivering cremated remains post-cremation, you most certainly want to have a delivery receipt showing that it was dropped off and who signed for it. And for the love of all, make sure people print. Okay, make sure people print their names. You do not want to have to try to figure it out who it was. Receipt of cremains by a family member or agent. I highly recommend this actually be part of the cremation authorization. So you have everything all in one place. Okay, all in one place. Any the disposition, family changes their mind, someone to pick up the urn, family decides to ship, etc. You need to get all of that done. And especially if it's something like changes their mind about cremation, you're going to want to make sure everyone is in agreement. Someone wants someone else to pick up the urn. All the people that signed that cremation authorization need to know about that. They want to ship it rather than whatever. Make sure everyone knows who you're shipping it to. So you really want this ironed out at the table. Okay, at the table. It is your responsibility to check up on and inspect crematories that you use. You're going to be found jointly liable for their errors. There are three things you can do to limit your liability. So you might pay, but you won't pay a lot. Show your due diligence and that you've been responsible. Request records once a year at a minimum. Ask and obtain copies of the crematory license or permit issued by the state. That's a no-brainer. Okay, that's a no-brainer. And you should probably check your state board minutes if you have a state board to make sure that if anyone's being disciplined, it's not the people that you're doing business with. They have their license suspended and you don't know about it? That's poo-poo on you. Policy and procedure manual for the crematory. So if you're using a third-party crematory, you should know or have a copy of their policies and procedures. If they are a membership, if they have memberships to any professional organization like CANA or the ICCFFA or NFDA, whoever it is, 
crematories uh, operators employed by the crematory and their certification or licenses? Do they hold, um, does your state have a license for people that cremate bodies? Are they safe operators certified through CANA or certified through NFDA or whoever? Do they have liability insurance? Do you have a copy of their insurance policy to know it's full and in effect? Have you looked at their inspection reports? Do you know if the state has notated any problems? Have you looked at their maintenance and inspection laws to make sure their equipment works? Review everything that it talks about. Ensure the crematory is acting within the laws of your state, your own business standards. Remember, they're an agent of you. So they better be doing something that you want them doing into a standard you wish to hold them by. And all proper procedures in performing cremations. Interview the management. Get information on personnel. Take a tour of the facilities. They don't want you to see something. You're a licensed funeral director. There's not much that should shock you. That would be a red flag. Take notes. Address any problems immediately. Typically, you'll want to know who owns the crematory, their experience, how many employees, age, training, how old is their stuff, how often do you service. Have them walk you through or witness what they do. That's even better. They explain it and they walk you through. An explanation of all steps from when a body arrives and is received to the point the cremated remains are delivered or picked up at the crematory delivered to your funeral home. And I mean step by step. On the day of the cremation, what do they do to verify the identity and the paperwork is in place? Following the cremation, how do they check to make sure that the cremated remains removed and then set aside for cooling are tracked from that point to pulverization and put into the correct urn. Do they have the um, identification stickers for the urns and the parts of the urns readily available and certificate of cremation handy? Does that follow with it? All things are things you want to know. With inspection, show up. Show up unannounced during normal hours. Use a checklist. Get a copy of your state checklist and use it as your own template. The state's looking for it. Probably a good idea that you should look for it. Raise concerns in writing. In writing. And I would, set up, I would set aside a copy and mail it to them so that there is no doubt that you have sent a notice. Ensure those concerns are resolved. Oh, I sent them a letter. They said they'd fix it. Really? You're going to trust it? Okay. Include everything a state inspector looks for. That's why I say use a state form. Posted, licensed, dressed, appropriately being professional, cleanliness, bodies handled in a secure and dignified manner, operational condition, processing and refrigeration stations, ensuring a crematory log and maintenance schedule are up to date. Check the cremation forms. You should be proficient. Okay, You should undertake some personal training to be able to read your charts so you know what a cremation temperature chart looks like. That is important. And you usually get that training through the professional organizations like National Funeral Directors Association, Cremation Association in North America. So I am going to jump back. I am going to jump all the way back to our buddies, Tri-State. Said I'd talk about it some other night. Well, tonight's the other night. So a Tri-State, 300 plus bodies, chucked out and back, not cremated, and had any one of the funeral directors done any of this, check license. They had a license. They were dressed appropriately. They wouldn't have let them in the back to look. They wouldn't have let them in the back to look. The operational condition, the person who was brought up by the Federal Bureau of Investigation because of the nature of what was going on, I met the gentleman that they requested because they requested a technician from the company who provided the equipment. Just walking up to it, you could see there was nests in the stack. Birds cannot nest in a vent that blows out 1,600 degree plus hot air. Okay? That is your rotisserie chicken and then some. Hope you like it charred. That would have been a clue. Just driving up to the facility, you could smell that there was something wrong. If you would have been in the back and if you were completely oblivious to the smell, which I don't know how you would do that, 300 dead bodies decomposing. That's kind of an exaggeration, but you know there's going to be at least 100 plus that are in active decomposition stinking up the place. 
you would see that the unit simply is not powered up. And the owner's excuse was, I don't know what went wrong with it, so I just didn't get it fixed, and I just started lying to people left and right and taking their money. Brilliant, right? The scheme was for $99, they would come get the body, they would cremate it, and then they would return the cremated remains to you. That's the whole kitty litter thing. They grind up kitty litter, and away it goes. Okay? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. No brands. Why they got the living bejesus suit out of them. Funeral directors, everyone, because it was too good to be true, and you should have done something. So he asks for the owner's manual of the unit. Remember the owner's manual? Copies of maintenance, inspection logs, crematory operator uh, policy and procedures manual. Right there. There it is turns to the operator's manual, procedure manual, troubleshooting. No power to unit. Walks out to the unit, turns on the power switch, no light. Step A, look for the main electrical, main electrical box. Is it in the on position? So he goes over, it's in the on position, he pulls it to off, he pushes it back up. No change. Ensure power is going into the unit. So you open up the panel, and there are those big copper fuses. And you get a $6 fuse tester, right? You put the prong on it. If it lights up, there's electricity. Do we have electricity getting into the unit? You test every one of the fuse areas. Power's going in. Check to see power going out from the box. So you go to the other side of the fuse, and you check to make sure it lights up again. It, one fuse did not light on the other side. So they pull the power. They pop out this $3 fuse you can buy at any home improvement store. Forget what it was, 15 amp, 50 amp, whatever it was. Puts it in. Puts the main electrical in the on position. Lo and behold, the cremation retort opens or powers right up. All the lights come on. And it starts its initial cycling. Power up and check. He walks over, hits the cremation start button, which would cause the spark that begins heating up the retort. And there was enough fuel, residual natural gas in the line, to initiate a spark so that the secondary burner could turn on. You'll learn more about cremation retort in another class. There's a wonderful book out there um, by Jason Altieri and John Fritsch um, that deals with the history of cremation. It's an excellent, excellent textbook. 30 plus ongoing years of funeral grief, disbelief, and suspicion from one company that could not replace a $3 fuse, folks. You should be insulted because... That is one of the things that hurt cremation and hurt funeral directors and our professional reputation for a long, long time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We will see you next time.